Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Vantage Seminar. So we're finishing today our series on lean in arithmetic geometry and algebraic number theory um, with a talk by Alex Kantorovich, uh, who will be speaking on polymath type pro projects in the age of formalized mathematics. And Alex, is it all right if we video this talk? Sure. Oh, great. And you know, if you have questions, feel free to ask them during the talk. Okay, please go ahead. Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to speak here. Um, as, as Rachel said, please uh, interrupt at any time and um, ask, uh, ask away. This will be very light on mathematical content and, and more about, uh, I don't know, sociological or something, uh, the, the way we, we collect things. So yes, yeah, so I wanted to um, put together a few thoughts on what polymath type projects could look like in the age of formalized mathematics. We heard a bit about um, this kind of a project from Kevin last week. So let me uh, take a step back a little bit. So um, in around 2009, I, I think, is when Gowers first uh, started experiments with, you know, massively collaborative mathematics and, and uh, how to do that. So this was on his blog. And um, there are lots of successful projects, uh, perhaps one of the most successful in the sense that it led to a Fields Medal is uh, Bounded Gaps Between Primes. This is after Yi Tang Zhang um, uh, proved his, his great theorem and, and people started uh, reducing uh, the amount and, and new ideas started coming in and, and Maynard, well, Maynard was working. See, yeah, so this is the caveat. The, the breakthroughs are still, the, the, the sort of huge breakthroughs were still due to individuals or maybe, you know, teams of two at most three people working together. But but it's still, I think, very uh, useful to try to understand what math could look like when we have lots and lots of people working together uh, on, uh, on a dedicated goal. Um, the, the idea being that if you're working the way we usually work, right, you just, you, you have something you want to, Think about you grab a, a friend or two or, or just work by yourself. Uh, you work in relative isolation and secrecy. Uh, you hope that you'll eventually prove something, write it up, post it to archive, you know, before somebody else does. Um, whereas if you're doing a polymath type project, you know, the very first thing is you announce publicly what it is you're trying to accomplish. And so there's no uh, there's no possibility of scooping in a sense. Um, yeah, of course, it helps. What does it mean to announce publicly? If if you have a blog like like Gowers or or Terry Tao, then uh, people will read that. If you, uh, um, it, yeah, so so it's not clear exactly what that means, but um, but you try to encourage participants and um, and and everyone can see publicly again whatever that word means uh, the progress of the project unfold as it as it progresses, and um, people from around the world people you've never met before, people you have no uh, other interaction with can suggest ideas. And um, the project leaders, uh, well, it's really a democratic process, but in practice, actually, there, there's uh, a project leader or two who are sort of watching over the thing and evaluating whether a suggested idea is likely to work, um, what to pursue, what to incorporate. Um, and so this, uh, this gives rise to uh, a serious problem, namely, um, Trust and verify. So the more the more people contribute, the more um, ideas they might contribute, and the more time you might be spending uh, verifying whether their ideas actually work. Uh, what's the old? I guess we're recording this, but I think it's okay. What's the old saying? Uh, the difference between mathematicians and philosophers is is the wastebasket. Uh, so you know their ideas, and ideas might might look promising, and they might be very tempting to spend a lot of time on, and then they might not work, and that happens to all of us all the time. Um, so, uh, so, tr so spending a lot of time and energy and effort on pursuing an idea uh, is, especially if it's it's something far from your own expertise. Um, you know, you want to try to evaluate whether this is something worth pursuing. Uh, that that can be difficult, and um, you know, so so what do we do? Well, sometimes we, especially okay, if we're working in in, in teams in in a pair, if, if this is just a collaboration in a pair. And uh, you have different expertise. You you might be tempted to trust that your co-author knows what they're doing, and you might say, "Well, I think this collaborator, you know, knows what they're doing, and and I can understand what what the argument is. I haven't checked all the details, but um, but I think it's okay." And uh, this is where a lot of errors happen in practice. And uh, but and so I had this ancillary question, uh, which I don't know, someone might want to chase up. Uh, is it true 
uh, that proportionally more co-authored papers have mistakes than uh, single author papers. I don't I don't know the answer to that. Uh, just a curious phenomenon. I don't know. I see Jordan. Uh, you, you you want to say something about that or? Yeah, I would imagine that more co-authored papers would have fewer errors. It's much easier to catch someone else's error than your own. Yeah, I guess it depends on if the co-authors are, um, I agree. Uh, it depends on if the co-authors are really in the same area or if they're trying to put something together from, you know, uh, like if the argument's really synthesizing different areas and, and you need both expertise, the expertise of both co-authors to, to make it work. Anyway. Um, yeah, well, so, okay, so we have this issue of, of trust and, and verify. Um, I guess I, I try to think about it in terms of like uh, building a rocket. Let's say we're trying to build a rocket to, to go to Mars. And, and so this is the an analogy of uh, trying to pr prove some big complicated theorem. Um, there's lots and lots of different components. They all have to come together perfectly uh, to execute the mission. And um, with rockets, well, we can tell that the people land on Mars or not. You know, are they uh, sending us um, a message from... Uh, uh, having landed. Uh, for theorems, well, all the action happens inside the brains of individuals. And uh, just imagine how lame our rockets would be if, in order to build a rocket, every single individual who wants to build a rocket has to be responsible for every single part that goes into that. Not just the, the specs of the part, but the manufacture of the part from scratch. And that's kind of what we currently do for math, where uh, you know, you're really expected to know, or at least that's what we tell ourselves, is that you're expected to know everything that you use from the ground up. Uh, you're expected to understand every uh, little bit of math that you use in a theorem, in part because we don't actually, I mean, our subject is supposed to be formal mathematics, but uh, it's it's in practice not written that way. And so if you, even if you're trying to take a, a theorem off the shelf, like a black box theorem, it might not be written with the kind of precision required to use in your particular case and so it's 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 risky. Uh, and so uh, Kevin had this great uh, discussion about uh, does any human being uh, truly know the proof of Fermat? And there's this uh, nice discussion he had with uh, Frank Caligari. I encourage you to uh, to read the whole thing. It's it's um, very insightful. Uh, as we heard last week, uh, Wiles and Taylor Wiles, or this uh, new approach uh, that uh, that Kevin is developing with Taylor. Uh, uses a dizzying array of techniques from huge landscapes of mathematics, and it's, um, you know, does uh, can can we trust any individual to put those all together? Oh, we we do we do trust, right? We we this is we do this in practice, but um, uh, there are lots of papers that use the classification of finite simple groups, uh, the the you know trace formulas that haven't um, maybe necessarily been written down in full generality uh, or or full uh, completeness. But what if we didn't have to? What if we actually worked formally in the theorem provers, such as Lean, as we've been talking about this whole time, and we can really embrace the idea of taking black boxes off the shelf, not just something that we do um, begrudgingly, but something that we like, okay, I don't have to think about this. Like, I, I want a part that does this. And if Lean tells me that someone has done that part, then I just use it directly. And I don't, um, it's, you know, guaranteed, as guaranteed as anything uh, that we do. Uh, to work as uh, as on the label, and uh, imagine what kind of rockets we can build uh, with uh, this kind of collaboration with this kind of technology. Uh, and I'm again reminded of the caveat that you know breakthroughs are likely to continue to come from from individuals. Um, so this is what I want to report on uh, a current ongoing project uh, called PNT Plus. So PNT Plus is something that uh, I'm co-organizing with Terry. And the goal is that uh, we were talking to Kevin and Fermat will need the Chebotarov density theorem. Um, if you can't even prove Dirichlet's theorem on primes and progressions, uh, well, that's a special case of Chebotarov, so we've got to get that. And um, well, if we're going to prove Dirichlet's theorem, not just, okay, you could say we just need the infinitude, fine, but we actually want to count how many there are. And so before you get Dirichlet, you better just do the prime number theorem. And the prime number theorem wasn't even in lean yet. So let's get going. Let's see how much how much we can do. Um, now, we have no doubt about the correctness of the prime number theorem, um, and uh, not only that, but it's actually been formalized four other times previously. So the first one was about 20 years ago already by Jeremy Avigad and company and Isabel. This was using the, the elementary method, Verdict Stelberg. Then uh, there was another proof in Hall Light using Newman's proof. 
uh, Newman's method. Then there is a metamath proof, uh, again, doing the, um, the elementary method. And a few years later, there's another Isabel proof doing Newman's method. So uh, we, we really can, uh, can kind of do this uh, in, in a variety of ways. What we will want to do in the PNT Plus project is um, develop things in the generality uh, that we think will be useful for getting Shabatarov. Shabatarov has not been formalized in any uh, in any proof um, assistant. So this is an experiment in trying to build a rocket because these are going to be complicated things with a lot of moving parts. Um, we're, of course, standing on the shoulders of, of giants in uh, setting up this project. So Terry had just completed a formalization of the polynomial prime and Ruja conjecture that he and uh, Tim Gowers and Ben Green and Freddie Manners um, had just solved. And that project was uh, an incredible achievement in three weeks from the paper appearing on archive and, and Terry saying, okay, I think we can formalize this to it actually being completely formalized. Um, uh, that, that was uh, quite an achievement. Uh, of course, that itself was building on lots of other similar projects in particular. Uh, so sphere version uh, is not the, um, maybe it is the, the one just before that, but, but there are lots and lots of projects of this kind liquid tensor experiment that, of course, uh, lots of people have uh, heard about and been talking about. But it's really, uh, the reason I highlight Patrick Manceau is uh, this blueprint technology that uh, that he uh, created that has been really central to um, to being able to do these kinds of large projects. So, so, of course, the organizational infrastructure will be the standard. We have GitHub processing all the pull requests. Uh, there's a blueprint. That, that this is the, the dependency, the, the current state of the uh, PNT plus project uh, blueprint. And then Zulip is where we chat about things and, and discuss and uh, make, make arrangements on what's going on and, and why and how. So, um, so every week, ideally, or three or five, depending on how much uh, progress we're making and how much is, is going on, um, I'll go through and select, you see the, the orange tasks here mean things that aren't done yet, but could be done. In other words, they're stated formally and uh, sort of the prerequisites are, are in place. Uh, the light orange are actually things that, and this isn't the standard, we, we have our own uh, numbering, uh, coloring um, scheme. So the, the light green are actually things that are, are already done. It's just that the prerequisites to them aren't done, which is actually a problem because the prerequisites might change, the, the, state, the statements of the prerequisites might change, which means you might have to uh, refactor how the, the light greens are done, but the dark greens are things that are completely done. And so, um, so here's how it works. Uh, I'll go through uh, and compile a list of, you know, these are the next targets that I think we should be pursuing. I'll uh, post this to Zulip, and and here's the the latest one that's there. It's already a little old and, and needs to be redone. So, um, so there'll be a list of targets, and people will write in and say, I claim this target, and I and I claim that target, and and this is done now. So, don't, you know, we don't need anybody working on this anymore. And lots and lots of people will write in and. Um, and claim things and um, and uh, you know make progress that way. So so the, the claiming is really important because just because I, I say like this is what what we want to do uh, in the same way that you don't want to get scooped uh, with with your archive post, you don't want to spend you know two weeks working uh, on something and wanting to contribute it, and the day before you are about to post it, someone else. Uh, jumps in and posts it. So, so this claiming a task is uh, really important to avoid duplicating work. Um, once whatever that claim uh, is done, wh whatever the, the the claimed project is successful, then the person just uh, uh, does a pull request in GitHub to the project. And here's what that would look like. So this is something I'm currently working on. And notice this X right here. This X means that uh, lean be before it even gets to uh, the pull request, uh, before I even consider a pull request, uh, allowing the, the pull request, um, it already checks, Lean has already checked whether the thing uh, compiles and, and everything works. So um, I would do more than just check that this uh, X isn't there, it needs to be a green check mark. Um, I, would, I would go into the code and see that the statement is what I wanted the statement to be, that the statement hasn't been changed, or if it has been changed, it's been changed to you know, a, a better version. And we can have some discussion about whether that is a better version or not. But then that's the black box. That's it. It's, it's someone has done it. It's come off the shelf and, uh, and it fit, fits the part perfectly into the rocket and we don't have to uh, worry about it. Lean does the rest. So um, 
So in practice, things move very rapidly. Uh, I'm constantly, uh, I constantly need to, uh, th there are more contributions that are coming in than I have time to um, uh, prepare the next set of, of uh, targets. So I did not, uh, purposefully, I didn't um, prepare the entire blueprint in every gory detail in advance. Uh, I, and Kevin spoke about this last week as well. Uh, this is kind of like a, a JPEG loading where every time we need to make a new out list of outstanding tasks we're like okay but how do we really prove this you know i said it, it'll go like this but i have to fill in a lot of details and create lots of new tasks lots of new orange things that need to go in there um that fill in the details so that every step is really something that um again we want people who are not experts in analytic number theory uh they don't have to know about l functions they don't have to know about complex analysis the the, the tasks can be really like you know calc one uh, difficulty tasks in terms of the mathematics, but they're difficult in terms of, um, uh, or they're, they're, they have varying degrees of difficulty depending on uh, one's uh, uh, ability and skill with lean. So, um, so that's basically the project. Let me uh, pause there for a second and, and check if there are any questions so far. Do you give a tentative label of how difficult you think each task will be? I do. I do. And in fact, uh, here, I think you can read. Um, uh, this This is almost working. This shouldn't be too hard. This shouldn't be too hard. This is done already. Uh, I, I guess some of them will be, you know, this, this is going to take a little work. And hopefully someone knows, you know, I have some integrals that need to get chopped up and added together. And then it, 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 each side... It, each integral needs to be bounded with um, with taking absolute values inside and yada yada. So I, I do have some sense of how hard it is, and uh, and I try to suggest that here. And oftentimes I'm wrong, and things that I thought were easy I end up being a, quite a bit more difficult, and and conversely. So Alex, I have a sort of a sociological question. I mean, this Please. is a massively collaborative project, but it's not a leaderless project, right? In a sort of usual collaboration of the type we know, there's there might be three or four people, but there would not be sort of somebody who is in charge of the collaboration typically. And I wonder if you think that inevitably this kind of project is always, it can never be leaderless and there will always need to be sort of a person who's like, I'm directing or whether that's, uh, maybe it's not even a problem. I'm just, note, I'm just noting it as a difference between our usual collaborative method. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I guess I would say MathLib itself is a massively collect, uh, collaborative project with no set leadership. I mean, there's there's a list of maintainers who are uh, watching the, the pull requests, but really um, people want to get involved. And so they jump in and they get involved. And, and, and there's no direction like, I think we need to be going here now. There are individuals contributing to MathLib who want to do certain things uh, and they have their own sort of directions where where uh, things are being contributed, but there's no one organizing MathLib in the way that we're organizing the, the PNT Plus project. So um, I guess, does that, does that answer your question, Jordan? It, it's like uh, MathLib, yeah, the sociology is, yeah. uh, MathLib itself is uh, leaderless, but the things that get contributed are often uh, due to, you know, one or several uh, individuals uh, Either contributing directly or organizing something like uh, like PNT Plus or the Polynomial Prime and Rouge or the Sphere version or Liquid Tensor. Any other questions? Okay, so let me um, and again, please interrupt at any time. So, so what? How's it going? So we open this to the public on. I had to look it up. It's January first, and we finished the proof of PNT on uh, April six. So that's this green arrow and you see their arrows coming into it and you see their arrows coming out of it. So we're not done with, uh, we want some consequences of PNT to be formalized. Uh, this was, by the way, not at all a race. Uh, we were doing all kinds of other things in the meantime. So uh, the fact that it was done in about a, a, you know, a month and change. If we were singularly focused just on weak PNT, we probably could have done it even faster. Um, so the, the project as originally envisioned, uh, we wanted to do three things. One, was uh, Michael Stahl had already reduced the prime number theorem to something called the wiener ikehara tiberian theorem, um, which basically can be proved by Fourier analytic methods. You don't, you don't need complex analysis. You don't need to move past the pole. You just need to go up to uh, a pole. And, um, and this is what's already uh, completed. 
um, there's a, a, a sort of attack number two, which we wanted to develop further some uh, API about Mellon transforms that was uh, already developed in MathLib by David Loeffler. Uh, we wanted to be able to pull infinite uh, vertical contours past poles and pick up residues. And, uh, and then, uh, and this would approach two, we had in mind to also prove a prime number theorem just with the asymptotic, not with an error term. And then approach three, we had in mind to get a classical uh, error term with a savings of you know e to the root log x. Uh, and for this, we were going to develop some uh, much more delicate complex analysis like the Hadamard factorization theorem. You know, you, you start, have, what's Hadamard factorization? You have an entire function of uh, uh, bounded growth and, um, and you want to express it as a product over uh, its, its zeros of some uh, some Hadamard factors. Uh, those are hard things to explain to a computer or design the, the structures needed to, to um, explain it to a computer in a way that's usable. You can, you can write all the definitions down, but to write them down in a way that's, that's really usable. Um, and you don't need the full, uh, the entirety. You can do a local approximation uh, with techniques of Landau. Um, but so, so this was the part that I was sort of thinking would take the longest. I thought we would get number one pretty quickly and, and we did. Uh, number two uh, is still in progress, but we're getting very close. And um, number three is in the distance. And as you'll see in a second, we might we might want to ditch project three and, and move on to other things because project two, it turns out we can do uh, uh, more than than what we had originally suggested. So really, these, again, were not so much uh, a question of can we prove PNT? We knew we could prove PNT. It, it was an excuse to get more analysis into MATLAB. So for example, we didn't have Fourier inversion. Uh, and not as a direct result of the project, but perhaps motivated by the project, uh, Sebastian Gazelle uh, got us Fourier inversion. Uh, we wanted to know things like the Fourier transform of a Schwartz function is Schwartz. So um, uh, Heather Macbeth and, and David Loeffler and I made the, the first step towards that of computing the derivative of a Schwartz, uh, of a Fourier transform. And um, you would think this is completely trivial, but this needs to be in the generality of Frechet derivatives and uh, you know, we wanted to do it MathLib style, and uh, Sebastian Gazelle managed to um, iterate on that, and then uh, Vincent Befara got that into the form needed for the uh, proof of the prime number theorem. So that's sort of how uh, part one was was finished. Um, MathLib is still missing, or at least one of the least developed areas from the early uh, grad, maybe late undergrad curriculum in MathLib. That's very I don't know if it's needed for analytic number theory, but it's certainly very useful for analytic number theory, is complex analysis. And so let me just say a few words about the kind of complex analysis uh, and, and how, how it's been going. So I first uh, heard about Lean in September 2000. Uh, let's say 2000, 2020 is what that should be. I think I had a 20 there and decided to add a couple more zeros uh, from, from Kevin. And, um, and Kevin mentioned that uh, complex analysis was, you know, was lacking. And I was like, oh, I'm teaching complex analysis. Let, let me help. So, so I look back at my notes and, you know, what's the definition? The, fir the first, you know, lecture one of complex analysis is you have a homomorphic function. You want to integrate along a curve. Well, what does that mean? You take a parameterization for that curve and then you integrate F of Z times Z prime uh, over the, you know, from A to B, whatever that is. Well, what is that? What is that exactly? Of course, we can write these things and uh, it's and we can manipulate them and we can... Uh, prove all kinds of uh, great theorems. But what is that structure exactly? And this is the issue I, I want to highlight, especially for people who haven't worked in formalization before, like something as innocuous as this. This seems totally trivial and, and obvious. And um, what does it really mean? So, OK, well, you want to be able to differentiate and you want to be able to integrate. So let's say, you know, it's enough to, to work with uh, C1 uh, curves. So, so Z should, whatever this parameterization is, and by the way, what choice of parameterization? Maybe we don't need to work in the abstract uh, with, with curves as equivalence classes of parameterizations. Uh, just work with the parameterizations directly. Fine, you, you can do that. Um, and then, well, actually, MathLib will want something. We will want the greatest generality. And, uh, you know, the key will be that this is integrable. So it's not, we don't actually need the, the derivative to be continuous, uh, just that it's integrable. Um, fine. But in order to be able to do all kinds of things, uh, let's let's say we're sticking to uh, piecewise continuous curves. What does that technically mean? So we could let's try out this definition. A curve, a piecewise continuous curve, 
is a map from not an interval to C. Uh, hopefully, uh, it's the, the point has been made that in uh, formalized systems, you want uh, you want to be. It's much easier in practice to say it's a it's a function from all real numbers to the complexes, uh, but we'll only care about what's happening on a, on a particular interval. And then we'll have a set of points um, so that the curve is uh, continuously differentiable or maybe just differentiable and iterable on this interval. And um, how do you want to implement that set of points? Do you want to say it's a finite set of points? Is it an arbitrary? Is it a countable set? Is it not a set of points at all, but rather a sequence from the naturals to the reals or from a finite set to, to the reals to know where these, these breaks are, where the curve uh, has has a corner and starts turning. So there's so many decisions that have to be made in a formalized system that are not at all uh, even remotely considerations when you work uh, as a pure mathematician informally. Um, so it's it's very, very easy to say this as a human and use it in a wide variety of contexts to prove all kinds of theorems. But uh, the decision of exactly how you want to set this up and, and notice if, if I'm just using sets of points, I want to say that the points are ordered. Or can you go forwards and backwards, and and uh, it won't matter. I, I don't know. This is um, just just to give you the flavor of the kind of decision making that has to uh, be done here to um, de determine what may be useful in practice. But then, of course, you start using it, and you realize that your first idea and maybe your seventh idea uh, aren't actually usable in practice, and you have to do something completely different. So does, does that kind of give give an idea of uh, like even when you start trying to do complex analysis? You're stuck. You're Can I ask a question, Alex? Analysis. Yeah, go ahead, Jordan. So, I mean, this is, and again, sort of having worked a little bit on the machine learning side, I'm very familiar with this phenomenon you say, the sort of things that are mathematically, you know, to us in our language, completely equivalent so much we wouldn't even think of them as different. Yes. Like give drastic, are, are drastically different in practice, like when implemented. Yes. And on the machine learning side, I feel like the problem is we have no idea which choices are going to be good ones in this world do you feel like you guys are developing mental heuristics for oh we've learned that this kind of way it's like, like for, for this particular question do you look at this and you're like oh from my experience i actually know like when you say or is it a closed interval do you secretly know oh that'll be trouble if i don't say closed interval or are we sort of still flying in the dark in terms of how we the choices we make as we set stuff up yeah so so there are two questions and they're really great questions one is about you know machine learning and and can't I just feed this into AI and AI will suggest in its wisdom uh, what, what the formalization will be that will work uh, very well. And uh, I think that's actually one of the things that the AI, that AI systems will be really bad at is um, designing these things. I think it's uh, at least, okay, who, who the hell knows, right? Why can't they just do everything that human beings can do? Um, but, uh, but, I think we will want definitions and API to be designed by human beings. Uh, and then with enough practice, uh, we'll, we'll know what, uh, what we want these things to be. Um, and then the AI can help us with the actual uh, theorems based on, uh, on those definitions. Um, although having said that, you know, AI could try out a definition and then it could try proving a bunch of theorems. And if it's uh, getting clunky to prove theorems, the AI could go back and uh, refactor uh, the definitions and make better definitions. Um, so this has already been done, for example, uh, with the definition of a group. The definition of a group was refactored in MATLAB several times, and now is uh, something much more, um, I don't know if I would say complicated, but much more sophisticated than the original. Uh, you would think like, what's a group? Everybody knows what a group is. You, you, you have an operation and you have inverses and uh, identity and that's it. Like what, what decisions are there to be made about the implementation of a group? And yet, if you if you open four different textbooks on group theory, the axioms of a group will be different in those four. And of course, they're not different in any meaningful way. It's just, uh, again, this, this issue of implementation. And so, um, Jordan, your second question, uh, if I can interpret it, is what have, what have we learned about this? And what I have learned about this in this, in this particular problem is to avoid answering this question. So, uh, so let me explain how we avoid answering this question and uh, try to go in a direction sort of orthogonal uh, to, to, it's really developing a different way of, of doing complex analysis where we don't have to answer what this is. Like this was perfectly fine for the informal, uh, for what we want to do informally. And it turns out that we can do pretty much whatever, well, we can do a lot 
uh, with by answering not this question, but uh, but saying that this is the wrong question. So so that's what I uh, will in fact discuss a, a little bit more um, in a minute. So it, was there another question? No. Okay. So 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 then uh, Vincent Befara uh, explained to me something that never occurred to me. You never need piecewise. So if you have a curve that's doing something weird and it's like a straight line here and a semicircle there, um, what you can do is pre-compose and, and you know you can compose uh, that that curve to not just be moving along a straight line, but to be moving along a straight line and then slow down to zero and then start moving along your semicircle, starting with derivative zero. And so you never you actually can always work with just uh, continuously differentiable curves, making them stop, uh, making them come to a full stop every time you want to uh, turn a corner. So that's a, a kind of cool innovation. Uh, but then you go, OK, fine. So so we, we don't need to worry about whether piecewise, uh, what, what the precise notion of piecewise is. We can just say differentiable curves. Fine. That's that, that we have. And that's uh, there's um, there's no issue with. Uh, OK, so then you want to integrate. You know, you want to say uh, the holomorphic function that I'm integrating over a curve. Well, holomorphic on what? Holomorphic on the interior of the curve. What is the interior? of a simple closed curve. This is a well-known issue uh, that uh, even human beings didn't think was an issue until um, they realized it was. And this is the famous Jordan curve theorem. This has also been formalized before. It was formalized by Hales in Hall. It was formalized in, in uh, Mizar. Um, and it's sort of notorious for being uh, very tedious, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of lines of code. And uh, okay, fine. So before you can do any complex analysis, you have to take six months and write up these 10,000 lines of code in lean. Of course, that won't be useful because Mathlib won't want those 10,000 lines of code because it's the wrong theorem. The theorem should be, you know, the uh, uh, case sphere, uh, something called homomorphic to a case sphere being taken away from Rn and computing the reduced integral homology <laughs> of that of that space. Uh, and and that will imply that uh, uh, you know uh, the S1 in R2 separates. Uh, R2 into an, and uh, two connected components, uh, one of which is is bounded. So um, so now you have to, okay, so now you, you don't do any complex analysis. You sit on your, uh, th you twiddle your thumbs, you sit on your hands and wait for someone to do this uh, homology uh, argument so that you have the Jordan curve there. I mean, you know, that's not a good way to make progress. So, uh, so, so that's not what we're gonna do. Um, we're, we're not going to use the Jordan curve theorem. And in fact, uh, already in uh, a number of textbooks, uh, the stein shikarchi approach is not to use the Jordan curve theorem, but to do whatever you want with keyhole contours. So, so you have some integral over a disk, and uh, maybe there's a pole at the center of this little disk. And so what you really want to do is, is say, well, you integrate sort of around the pole, and then you shrink these two things uh, down together. And then you, you, that proves that the integral over a big disk is the same as the integral over a little disk. And the little disk, you know, you zoom in far enough where you can use just the continuity and not even the holomorphicity uh, of the function. And you can, you know, expand in a power series or whatever you want to do. Um, you really want to code this up? You really want to think about what the general keyhole type contour is where you have to go, you know, from here over there along a straight line, from here over there along some, at some direction. And there's a point and like, can you imagine how, ungodly it will be and, and remember you have to take uh you have to compose that with with something that uh slows down to a complete stop at each corner so so again this is just uh <laughs> the difficulty of uh doing something formally that as uh as a working mathematician you wouldn't think twice about so uh the big and this is completely tri completely trivial but the big breakthrough for me in my mental block of wanting to do any complex analysis was realizing that for the applications to analytic number theory, the only thing we will ever need is rectangles. And so let me explain what I mean by that. I mean, this is completely obvious. Um, we have Green's theorem in MATLAB, thanks to Yuri Kadrashev. And uh, so we know that the integral of a holomorphic function over a rectangle, there's no question about what the interior of a rectangle is, that integral is zero. So here's what that looks like in lean. Oh. Uh, I'm missing a slide. I wanted to explain this little innovation. Uh, again, these are everything I'm calling innovation is something that uh, before I, I did any of this, what I would call a triviality. Uh, but uh, here's something novel that we're doing in this project, uh, namely 
usually when you have a blueprint, you have a separate tech file uh, and you're writing tech in that file. And uh, there you, you put things like label rectangle and it uh, maps to the lean thing called rectangle that'll find the lean thing called rectangle to hyperlink across the two. And then you go to a separate lean document and you work in that lean document and prove all your uh, all your theorems. And it gets very annoying if you want to change something in the lean document, you will have to remember, oh, wait a second, I've actually changed what the definition is. I want to go back into the blueprint, the, the LaTeX, and um, you know, I want these things to, to be to be corresponding. So I'll change the, the, the human, the natural language definition. And uh, I, I thought this was not the best way to, to work. And so what, um, I mean, Ian uh, Yasling and I wrote a, a little script where in addition to the usual de uh, delimiters, so these are the, the things that you comment out, this uh, this backslash dash and, and dash backslash just says to lean, don't read anything that's here. You can write whatever you want. For example, here we've written a rectangle has corners Z and W, and this is gonna go into the, um, the documentation that's generated. We also made this delimiter, this uh, double uh, ampersand, or whatever, this is not ampersand, this is uh, just percent, the uh, double percent before and after, and wrote a little script that will scrape out. So this is this is uh, LaTeX in the same file, in the same exact file, and right in the same location as the lean. And so if you ever wanna change um, the lean, you change the LaTeX right next to it, and uh, and then if something goes and scrapes this out and makes a, a LaTeX file that then is uploaded to the blueprint. So why is this interesting? Well, uh, for two reasons. One, um, when you've written the natural language version and you have Copilot running, then you just put your cursor here and Copilot suggests the formal version. So you can uh, interact very, very efficiently with AI that drastically in practice speed up, speeds up the, the workflow and um, I've found to be really, really useful. So having the two together, uh, they really complement each other. Sometimes it's the the natural language that is complemented by the formal definition, and and conversely, because um, uh, Copilot is reading the the entire file. Okay, so um, so I meant to to point this out and, and say something about this. And the and the use uh, we're really using as uh, as much as we are able to, we're using uh, AI to um, auto complete some of these things. So what's a rectangle? You have two complex numbers, Z and W. The Z and W are the corners. So I'm thinking of Z is over here and W is over here. So it's the real part of Z, comma, the W part of Z, but it could be in any in any orientation, actually. So this is unordered uh, closed intervals. Uh, same thing for the imaginary parts. And then you take the, the complex product. So the, the set of all things that have this real part and this imaginary part. That's, the, um, that's what a rectangle is. And then here's the theorem. It's called uh, holomorphic on dot vanishes on rectangle. So uh, if the function f is holomorphic on some set u uh, and u contains the rectangle with corners z and w, then any rectangle integral, which which means you integrate you know, along the rectangle, and we don't have to worry about what it means to be, um, uh, it's just a sum of four integrals. So we're not slowing down. It's just a you know, nice, um, uh, uh, it's just a simple function. We're not doing this uh, this idea of slowing down to turn a corner because we don't have to worry about uh, what we mean by rectangles. We know what it means by rectangles. So the integral of uh, of f over the rectangle defined by z and w that integral is zero. Okay, and and the proof is uh, one line uh, uh, one line application of uh, the Green's theorem. Okay, so so this is what the uh, you know, so we know that the integral of, of a rectangle of a homomorphic function is zero. Great. So what? Well, here's the crazy thing. Uh, rectangles tile rectangles, unlike disks tiling disks. So remember, we had that big disk and we wanted to zoom in on a little disk and we we're trying to get there by some kind of uh, keyhole contour. If you are just working with rectangles, what you'll do is chop the rectangle into nine smaller rectangles and eight of them will be away from your pole. And so you just integrate all of these and they integrate to zero. So that big rectangle integral is exactly equal to the tiny little rectangle integral zoomed in on, on the points. So you can zoom in as much as needed with just chopping rectangles. Uh, great. But now you're left with evaluating something like, you know, if you have a pole at this point, then you want to evaluate uh, integral of ds over s. Traditionally, you do this over a disk. And so when you parameterize ds over s over a circle, 
um, everything cancels out and you just get one basically. And, you're, you're, and then you get the circumference two pi i. Uh, what do you do for a rectangle? So I'm thinking if this is a rectangle, let, let's move everything to the origin. So the rectangle goes from minus epsilon minus i epsilon up to epsilon plus i epsilon. This is like the notation for integrating over this rectangle. So this has four components. The bottom component is an integral in x going from minus epsilon to uh, plus epsilon with s being x minus i epsilon. Okay, so hopefully you see this, this parameterization. Then you have the, the right-hand side, the top and, and the bottom. And um, this looks complicated. You're gonna have to you know work with complex logs in order to evaluate this. It's like, it, it looks like it's gonna be hard. And uh, it turns out it's not hard at all because if you take the bottom and the top together, so this is the bottom, this is the top. I'm integrating from minus epsilon to epsilon, but in the other order, because the top is oriented that way. And a very easy calculation shows that when you add these two, two things together, you get x squared uh, plus epsilon squared, and you make a change of variables, x goes to epsilon x, the epsilons all cancel, and you just have this integral. This integral is arctan, that, that is just the real uh, integral, you don't have to do anything with it. And this is pi over four, another pi over four, and, and you get pi i contributing from going along the bottom and going along the top. Then you do the same thing over the right side and the left side contributes another pi i, and this rectangle integral turns out to be two pi i. Okay, so this is the kind of, I'm just showing you this to illustrate how, um, like, is this any different from what we do in the standard way? I wouldn't say it is, uh, but it makes the formalization so much easier to be able to, to argue in this way. And, you, and, and it's a fun little, um, you know, aside, a, a fun way of solving these kinds of, uh, of problems. So what about pulling contours? You know, you have a Mellon transform. Uh, you might want to do things like uh, proof per Perron's formula. So the, the proof of Perron's formula, so uh, this too, I, I guess this is an algebraic number theory seminar. So maybe uh, I should remind people what the analytic people do with their contour <laughs> integration. But uh, this notation means an integral from two minus i infinity to two plus i infinity. And of course, there's nothing special about two. It's just uh, some some positive number. And um, and what's the human proof of this Perron type formula? Well, if x is less than one, of course, x is uh, positive. I, I don't see that I've said that. x is a positive parameter. If x is less than one, I pull this contour all the way to the right. I can pull contours because I have one over s squared. So it's integrable at infinity and everything's going to, to zero at infinity. And I pull the contour uh, to the... I say to the left, but I realize now I mean to the right. So that's a, a little typo. I pull to, to the right. Um, I get a, a, a large real part of S and X is less than one. So this thing in absolute value is just going to zero and we get nothing. Or you pull to the left, not right. You pull to the left. You pass through the poles at S equals zero and S equals one. That gives you these two residues. You combine those two residues and that's this, this formula. So um, great. You, you do that as a human being in 10 seconds. What do you do on the computer? Um, well, here it is. Here's what it looks like in lean. So this is the Perron formula uh, in the case where x is greater than one. So I have x is a real number. Sigma is a real number. Uh, sigma is the real part of s. So instead of integrating over two, we can integra integrate over anything as long as sigma is positive. And if x is greater than one, uh, then the vertical integral, the vertical integral is this kind of integral where the, the real part is, is sigma. So that's the second second uh, parameter. And then vertical integral prime means you have this one over two pi i in front. So this one over two pi i integral over the vertical line at real part sigma, where sigma is positive, of the function that sends s to x to the s over s times s plus one evaluates to one minus one over x. Okay, now what are these up arrows? Well, x is a real number and um, I want to take a real number to a complex power, and Lean doesn't know how to do that. So uh, it could, but but the um, the way it's designed is you should be taking complex numbers to complex exponents, even though that's a problem. Uh, the way we think about it in uh, the way we teach our our complex analysis students, there's just a choice that's made in Lean for what that uh, is, and then it's up to you to quote the correct theorems that apply in your setting. Uh, so, so this up arrow is the coercion of x from a real number to a complex number so that we can be raised to a complex exponent. Uh, and same thing here, the left-hand side, uh, I'm sorry, the right-hand side, I guess I have my right, lefts and rights all uh, uh, discombobulated. The right-hand side here, you would think, well, this is a real number. And these, uh, so these are also real numbers, but we're integrating um, 
we're actually integrating things that are um, complex. And so the, the, in, the resulting integral is also complex. So that's what this up arrow is. The ones don't need up arrows because uh, Lean will just interpret the ones as complex numbers. But the right-hand side is actually a complex thing. You would then have to do something to get it back into a real number if you want to use this in, in various applications. Okay, so so how do we actually, this is what it looks like, but how do we execute contour pulling uh, in, in Lean? Contour pulling is adding and subtracting rectangles. So if so, you have a big rectangle, and you know that the integral of the rectangle, let's say we're pulling to the right. So the integral of the big rectangle is zero. Um, and uh, and then you have to worry about the top and the bottom, but the top and the bottom are also rectangles or limits of rectangles. So we can take uh, rectangles. We can say that this top part goes uh, goes to zero. We can also say that by the rectangle pull, we can get over here. And this part's going to zero just by putting absolute values inside the integral. So um, yeah, all of this, again, mathematically is a triviality. And the question is, how do you uh, execute it in Lean? And it's actually pretty easy. And we now have all the API to do it uh, to, to prove um, these, these kinds of things. All right. Um, I won't go too much more into what we, um, what we uh, are doing. Having built up enough complex analysis, um, we are now, so I, I said there, was, there were three approaches. The first approach was a Tiberian theorem. The, the second approach was a complex and analytic approach. In fact, what I realized halfway through the project is that having done just this much complex analysis, we can already get an error term that's not e to the root log x, but e to the 1 10th power uh, of log x. And that is plenty for any application. So I think what we'll do is forget the third approach. Uh, of course, the best we know today is the exponent three fifths instead of one tenth. The classical error term is one tenth. Um, it's an exercise to prove the three fifths to one, which would be a quasi Riemann hypothesis, uh, depending on the constant now. Um, but uh, so using elementary arguments like partial summation, you know, Titchmarsh style uh, mathematics, with what we've already done, we can prove uh, the prime number theorem. And this is I would say maybe two or three weeks off uh, at the pace we're, we're currently going. So this is already better than any power of log. The asymptotic formula is not quite good enough for certain applications. You might have to, in the application, you might lose like five powers of log. And so you want something that's better than any power of log. And uh, this error term already is. And there's sort of no real reason to push for the classical one just because it is the classical one. If we're going to do best possible, fine, let's go to best or at least best known. Let's go to best known, but I sort of no longer am interested in this uh, part three. So after we get that, we'll work on, as I said, Dirichlet's theorem and building towards uh, Shibatarov. Uh, there's a little uh, side question. Does any of this actually count as research? It certainly feels like, uh, you know, finding new ways, new approaches through things, but they're sort of, you know, obvious a posteriori. Um, Anyway, so uh, anyone who wants to, so these are the, the various contributors, you know, lots and lots of people. I, I have no idea who some of these people are. I've never met them before. Um, some are, of course, people that I uh, know or people that I've interacted with online. Um, so if you want to contribute, uh, go to Zulip and, and hop in, join the fun, uh, come on to GitHub or, or just email me and uh, let me warn you that uh, this is actually quite a lot of fun and you might get sucked in. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Alex. Let's see, Jesse, do you want to start with the questions? Yeah. Um, hey, Alex, uh, one, thanks for a great talk. Um, so one thing I've sort of had in the back of my mind, I've heard a bunch of talks like this, is that like this is a new technology that's allowing for uh, much larger scale collaborations than we've had in the past. And, and um, this was discussed at like the National Academies workshop or you know, webinar like last weekend. Yeah. And people, you know, mentioned things like CERN or LIGO as examples from like neighboring fields where like, look what you could do if you had a massive collaboration that yeah. you couldn't do kind of individually. Um, is there any pathway to getting something that would be the analog of CERN, like in math, where like it was actually working on an outstanding fundamental problem that like could not be tackled in any other way? I mean, because like, it looks like right now, like there's a sense of like, can we know where we want to go or where... It would be appealing to go if this took off in our wildest dreams. And right now we're rebuilding things where every instance that I know of, and I'm even going to include Liquid Tensor, is already doing something that a human knew how to do without anything like this. And yes. understandably, we need to expand the library, 
but it, you know, feels like sort of, you know, there's a, some gap uh, between what were the kinds of things that we're doing right now and the kinds of things that would make this, I think, really revolutionary um, uh, impact on the field. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a fantastic question. And uh, you're absolutely right. The, the, the issue with trying to do a, a, uh, an actual research project where we're trying to find new truths in mathematics is, um, is that we don't, you know, for, for many fields of mathematics, we can't even state research level projects precisely because they're not enough of the ground has been built up. You know, we, we've had, uh, well, 2,000 or 4,000 years of <laughs> de development of the subject, or maybe 200 years, you know, uh, like oh, the last 200 years has just been an absolute explosion in what uh, what mathematics looks like. And until at least lean or math lib or, or any other system, I'm, I'm agnostic in terms of what the system is, what the library is, uh, you're absolutely right. We have to develop these things to the level that they're useful for research. And then we can try to do projects uh, to actually investigate novel mathematics, which is what the polymath, uh, polymath wasn't supposed to, well, I mean, it was actually uh, Gowers's uh, polymath things. We're trying to prove new theorems, uh, not just um, reprove or give uh, better estimate. I, yeah. Um, so uh, we that's definitely what we want to do in the longer term. Uh, it's just, we're nowhere near being able to do that, at least in the fields that, uh, like, I can't state any of my theorems in, in Lean yet, uh, yeah. or any of my questions, <laughs> any of the questions that I'm actively working on in my research, I can't state in Lean. There's just are, not enough we, in the library. Are we at the point yet where, like, um, uh, leaders of this effort could begin to develop a collective roadmap that might get us to a collaborative project that would truly tackle something that um, is of fundamental interest? Like, I don't, I don't need an existence proof that you couldn't do it any other way. But like, I think that it would be a very different thing uh, if um, you could take an outstanding conjecture that's been open for several decades and knock it off in a team of like 100 people using something like this. That would, that would I think, be wonderful. Yeah, um, it would be wonderful. Um, you know, there's a, the question is, how do you get people interested? This takes man hours. This mm -hmm. takes human beings deciding that they want to spend their time doing this. Right. And so, um, uh, you know, the, the projects like PNT plus, like uh, sphere version, like for Ma's last theorem, they're, they're uh, well, they're, they're interesting in their own right, but they're also excuses to get people to, okay, guys, can we focus on this uh, thing now and try to get uh, the, the Fourier transform of a Schwartz function in Schwartz. Can we get that formalized? Um, can we, can we get the definition of an automorphic representation formalized? Um, once a number of these things are done, then we could be in position uh, to work on something. Now you could say, okay, uh, some like Erdős problem could probably already be formalized now, the statement, right? There, there's, there are things that are much lower on the uh, uh, development from axioms to, to uh, definitions. Um, the question then is how do you get people to work on it? You could say like, you know, I have some idea on how this might go, but uh, the difficulty with formalization is you actually need to know the human proof <laughs> in order to be able to teach the computer <laughs> the proof. Like, a, uh, so it's almost like you should just do a regular polymath first and get the proof before you get the um, the formal proof, at least as things are now. Um, so. How are you going to convince people to work on something that's not only a formal project, but an open problem where, uh, you know, if enough people like there's no, uh, the only failure, the only potential failure of this project is it gets so annoying and time consuming and nobody wants to do it anymore. And then we don't reach Shibatara, right? There's no danger that we don't know how to do Shibatara. We'll, we'll figure it out. We'll, it's, it'll be complicated and it'll take time and it'll, we'll make wrong steps and, and uh, have to refactor things, but eventually we'll get there if we put enough effort into it. Uh, whereas our math problems solvable, you know, if they're, if they're open. So, so I think that's the, that's the thing. If someone like, like Terry or uh, Tim uh, says, okay, I want to work on this problem and I want to work on it and work on it formally at the same time. And here's my, you know, proposed attack on the problem. 
I think that could be very effective. So um, just building on Jesse's questions, like if you think about the prime number theorem as a key step towards um, Dirichlet's theorem and Chebotarov's theorem, like what are the other key steps needed to lay the groundwork for like the BSD conjecture or the Riemann hypothesis? Yeah, well, the, the Riemann hypothesis is already stated in Lean. In fact, uh, it's it's also stated in Mathlib. There's there's a way to state conjectures in, in you know, it's, it's called proof wanted. Um, uh, so BSD, in order to state BSD, you need elliptic curves. Uh, which is part of what uh, the FLT project is going to formalize, it, it, you know, give the definition, uh, at least some version of a definition. Um, you need uh, to be able to count, you need to reduce elliptic curves, ma p, and count points, and uh, talk about the, the rational points and the, uh, the rank, and then talk about the L function. And, well, you don't know that that L function is uh, actually... It, um, it, you know, has analytic continuation because you don't know that it, the elliptic curve is modular. I mean, that's uh, also hopefully what will be uh, the outcome of uh, Kevin's project eventually. Um, and then you can speak of, okay, so now we do have this holomorphic function and, and is its uh, order of vanishing at the center line equal to the rank? Like in order to state all of that, just to state all of that is in and of itself, you know, several years worth of mathematics that needs to get uh, developed. Um, that's not at all to say that it can't be done. It should be done. And I, I think in, in due time, it will be done. Um, in terms of what the, you know, having, okay, we've proved the prime number theorem, at least some, some weak version of it. We want a stronger version. We want something that, that we can use complex analysis to pull contours because that'll be a little easier, especially once we get to things, uh, like, uh, you know, zeta functions of number fields and so on. Um, uh, the, the, the prime number theorem itself is just a warm up. It's just a warm up to try out before we try uh, all of the technology that we'll need for Shabatarov. We want to warm up on getting the kinks out, out of the complex analysis. And then with Dirichlet's theorem, we'll get a few more kinks out in, in handling L functions with uh, not just one as the coefficient. And then, uh, and then of course, it'll, it'll be a whole other uh, set of uh, things that we'll need to do uh, for, for Shabatarov. So really, it's just a warm up. This is like, um, uh, trying to grease the, uh, uh, well, what's it called? Uh, grease the joints uh, to go for, for Shibatara. Did, did I answer your question, Rachel? Yeah, that's it's really yeah. a, kind of a cool perspective to spend three years doing a warm-up. Uh, <laughs> but it, maybe it's a warm-up for the whole community. So. Right. Yeah, someone has to do it. I mean. Yeah. Yeah, let's see. Uh, are there other questions here? Yeah, I had a question about your plans for Chebatara, um, <clears throat> I mean, one way to do that is to prove class field theory first. Um, <laughs> but um, there's a there's a theorem, I know you probably know this, the Frobenius density theorem, which is like a Chebatara light, which is much easier to prove. And yeah. it's, it's something that's not, I mean, usually you cover that when you're after Dirichlet's theorem on prime standard meta progressions. Um, but I was curious if you had an alternative path to Chebatara that didn't, that didn't go, didn't at least require art and reciprocity. Um, we do not at the moment have an alternative path because we're, again, it's like a JPEG where we fill in whatever we're ready for. And, um, and so the next thing that we're preparing for as we're finishing up this, uh, you know, uh, better error term in the prime number theorem, it was, we're gearing up for Dirichlet. And when we finish that, we're going to start discussing what it would really take to, uh, to get Shibatarev. And I think you just joined the project by suggesting that before we go for the full thing, we go for just the Frobenius uh, version. Um, so again, that'll be a nice little warm up. And if we can get that, then we can get the next thing. We can constantly build on, on it. Of course, in Mathlib, the final version will just be Chebatarev. And, uh, and for the prime number theory will be a special case <laughs> where the extent, where, where the ground field is Q, the extension is, is Q <laughs> and, and there's no art and symbol. <laughs> right. Um, so, so we'll hopefully get there. Jesse. Um, just sort of thinking about your response, are people doing like large scale RUs to formalize and build out MathLib? Because it seems like if the question is this is a, a manpower issue, we want it to be useful for the people doing it, and it's not clearly research, and we right now need to do a lot of investment on things that researchers already know how to do. 
then that like screams REU as a productive um, activity for me. Absolutely. And uh, Kevin has been doing this basically as an REU, except not over the summer, but all year round. He yeah, yeah. The, uh, uh, um, what's it called? Xena project where he just has undergrads doing I mean, it's it's an REU that's all all year round. Um, and uh, yes, uh, people can and should do that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We didn't make our project specifically geared towards undergrads, but I have no idea. Some of these people, I have no idea. I think somebody, one of these contributors, and this isn't the full list of contributors, it's just some snapshot of, uh, of it, are, are like engineers who have a few hours on the weekend and want to play with this stuff. Yeah. And they contribute amazing things very rapidly. <laughs> And um, we, we all suggest this and, and, you know, recognizing that it's easy to lob ideas and, and then someone has to actually do work. Um, yes. But like, you know, having a, a, a prominent REU on the scale of 100, 200 students or more a summer that we could direct interested students to would actually be kind of great. Right. Right now, like there are large scale REUs like the U Chicago one or other in you know, Duluth that you can send people to. And just and, and there's something gained by like for, especially for undergrads getting them all together and having them have the community and the experience for the summer and, and whatnot um that's different than just like shine up for a pond mouth project in your few hours or whatever um yeah it's gonna be something that would be really uh service the community and could massively um uh start you know moving forward a lot of these efforts that we're trying to do and would be really great for the students right because they would learn past field theory and you know analytic number theory and all the other things that are formalizing in the process of, of contributing. Yeah, that would be amazing. Uh, someone has to do it, uh, exactly as you said. Um, I, I, you know, there's some complicated questions that need to be answered, like is 100 a good number or is four a more manageable number? And how do you get, you know, there's a startup cost to learning how to use Lean in the first place. Uh, we're at Rutgers actually discussing, you know, how much of our undergraduate curriculum can we Leanify and uh, so that people just are, are natives at this, right? When, when LaTeX first came out and you're like, okay, backslash dollar sign, like no one's going to use this. And now everybody, all our undergrads are type up their homework in, in LaTeX because it's easier. It's actually easier than writing it out by hand once you're comfortable with it. And so in the same way, we have to get lean to the point where it's easier to use lean than it is not to. And then uh, why wouldn't you uh, pick it up? So so we need to train undergrads in how to use Lean. We need to get them uh, into REUs. We need to figure out the right infrastructure in order to be able to organize 100 people uh, or 10 people and uh, and have blueprints where they where they can each have their own project that they're pursuing that matches. The hard thing is it has to match their interest. So some people are really interested in combinatorics and they want to do the combinatorial part of the argument. And some people like the integrals and some people like the complex analysis and um I don't know how to assign that. It's it's much better to for it to happen organically, where people just say, "I think I can do," you know, number seven, and you say, "Okay, number seven's yours. Go go at it." Um, so yeah, there's some very very interesting questions. Uh, of course, you have to get funding for this. This yeah, we're we're uh, on the cusp of some very interesting developments in the sociology of how mathematics may be done in the future, or five years from now, this will all have been a fad and we go back to writing on paper. I don't know. There's a very interesting comment in the chat. I don't know um, yes. if this one wants to say it or. For the neurological aspects of learning, I think we need to preserve both the analog mode and the digital. I agree completely. And in fact, the, the courses that we're trying to design are ones where the homework is all done online uh, with Lean. And then um, the exams are paper where you write formally what you would, you have to like, it'll be some small snippet of a theorem and you on paper write out what the, uh, you know, what's, what, what the proof is and, and, or what's the, you know, given, given the current goal state and this tactic, what is the new goal state? Because the students exactly understand what's, what's really going on. And they're not just um, pushing around some random buttons until something works. What happens if there's a solar flare that burns all electronics? Yeah, that's a great question. I have no idea. I have no idea. That's a big, that's a big problem. Um, it's a big problem for online journals. It's a big, I guess you bury things underground or something. I don't know. Maybe Drew knows the answer to that much, much more than I do, because I'm sure that's a serious issue for, for people that would actually use computers. Maybe I'm, I'm uh, cosplaying a computer user. I, I, I learned the word GitHub like two years ago, so I'm not, 
I'm, I'm like the farthest thing from a computer expert. I think what's interesting to think about is every time you add something to the curriculum, and this is a substantial new thing for an undergrad to learn, something else has to go away, you know? And so it's not always win, 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 right? Like, and so like, that's an important discussion maybe for the math community to have is like, what, what are we ready to let go of in a standard sequence of courses? Yeah, that's absolutely uh, a great question. And uh, time is limited and there's only so much you can learn in a certain period of time. Um, I don't know if that question can be answered uh, without empirical. Like I would think that question will be answered in due, in due time uh, as a result of experiments that run and we, and we learn, you know, we really can't take this much time to do that or, or these video games are really fun and kids like doing it and they can cover a lot more material. I mean, it could be, it could potentially, if done right, uh, turn out to be a win, win, win where you, you just learn more material. You know, I remember, um, God, I'm, I won't say who, uh, but I remember uh, being an undergrad and sitting in on some classes where I could not understand what the hell the professor was talking about. And uh, I would go try to read the book and, and make sense of things. But it, it, it's, uh, I think so much confusion can be avoided if next to the human intuition and understanding, we have the formalization. And if there's something you don't know, you can click through to the statement of the theorem and read the definition and read the, the exact statement and, and look at the proof for yourself. Um, if you've forgotten what the, you know, what the axioms are or something like working in these systems may actually speed up, not just, uh, it, may, it may not only be a cost that you have to learn the system, but once you've learned the system, you may actually be able to acquire the knowledge uh, that the course is meant to to impart more rapidly, potentially. Um, but you're you're absolutely right. The costs have to be weighed against the benefits. I don't know how to do that a priori. It's not the kind of thing I could regulate before before starting on an experiment. I would just have to see what actually what works in practice and and adjust uh, the systems as as we go. You know, constantly reevaluating what's what's working, what's not.